Okay, so this is the fourth class, I think it's the fourth class, of, um, of our Utopian Desire Through Sci-Fi. And I have a shiny PowerPoint presentation. And today we're going to be looking at a book called, uh, or a trilogy called Lilith's Brood. Um, also, I think, published under the name of Exogenesis. Um, uh, we're going to start with uh, kind of a little bit of a reminder of the uh, timeline that I posted a few weeks. No, I think it was in the first class. Um, and I just wanted to bring it back so we can kind of see where we are and uh, what's going on in um, in the kind of the, the bigger picture. Um, the, the, so we've done the dispossessed, which you can kind of see there. And in the first class, we talked about Thomas More, we talked about Marcuse, we talked about Block, we did the dispossessed. We've mentioned Antiedipus a few times. Uh, we've done Woman in the Age of Time. You can see that I'm kind of pointing at my screen, so maybe it looks a bit worse from your side. Um, then now we're doing Lilith's Brood, which was published at um, very, very close to um, a lot of. Uh, feminist writings by Donna Haraway, uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, and you can see that we're kind of jumping around the timeline a little bit because um, we're going to go back and look at Missouri and Harland in a few weeks' time. Um, but it it uh, you know it doesn't particularly matter that we're jumping around. It's just for kind of like our own reference uh, of where things are, and I guess which um, which ideas and which things were published kind of near each other uh, I think kind of helps us get a bit of a picture of what the general kind of I'm going to use an academic word uh, discourse was around at the time kind of academic and also um, activist maybe or feminist or uh, in terms of sci-fi and literature so today's class we're going to start as usual with spoilers uh, I hope you don't mind. I hope you've managed to get a look at at least the first book of the trilogy. And uh, so the trilogy was published, I think, first in uh, 1978 under the name of Xeno, Xen, Xenogenesis. Um, it's by the author Octavia Butler, who's a um, black feminist, died in uh, 2006. Um, um, a little bit untimely, she was born, I think, in 1947. So she's uh, quite young. Um, and I put very much the wrong year in my PowerPoint. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it, sorry, yes, that's it. It was published first under the name of Xenogenesis in uh, 1978 and then was published as Lilith's Brood in 2000. Uh, but it's the same book, it's the same trilogy. And the books are called Dawn, Adulthood Rights and Imago. And I'm about to give you spoilers for Dawn um, if you haven't read it. Um, so the book is uh, starts with um, a woman called Lilith and she wakes up in this room where there's absolutely nothing, there's just a bed and a toilet um, and um, it's kind of like I guess some point in the future or nearish future uh, and it's a post-apocalyptic world. Um, she's one of, well we later on learn that she's one of the few human survivors of of a nuclear war that happened on Earth. Um, and she wakes up in this room and um, and that's, that's not the first time she's woken up in this room. And every time she's um, awakened, uh, she can't really understand why is she there? Why is she being confined? Uh, like in the first few times, I think she just she's just given food and nobody's talking to her. Nobody's telling her anything. There's no response when she asks to speak to people. Um, so she's just kind of, looked after but not really um not really told why she's there and then uh we see this or we hear <laughs> she hears this disembodied voice that starts asking her questions and she refuses to answer um and it kind of is like um complicated then at some point she kind of starts answering because she wants to know answers herself um and during one of those awakenings she uh meets an alien um who has tentacles all over their body um, and the tentacle I, I'm so going to mispronounce all the words and they're probably not going to be um, the way that uh, Octavia Butler intended them or the way you read them in your heads but um, sorry about that uh, so she she meets this alien and um, 
uh, the name of the alien, I don't know, I can't pronounce it, Jihaya, um, and they say that they uh, represent an alien race called the Oankali. And uh, the Oankali have um, come uh, when uh, the, they've kind of sensed that there is going to be a nuclear war and Earth is going to be destroyed, and they kind of go around the universe as a, some sort of benevolent um, alien race that saves other uh, other races uh, and they um, um, so they've they've arrived at, to earth uh, just before the nuclear war and they managed to save kind of a bunch of humans and one of them is Lilith and these humans um, are, they, they kind of heal them and keep them safe until they are ready to uh, face the aliens I guess so Lilith finds out that she's been asleep for uh, over 250 years um, and uh, she's been kept on this alien ship where they are and the tentacles covering the body of the alien are um, kind of like sensory organs um, they're, they're, they uh, we're not really we're kind of told that humans can't really understand uh, what exactly um, the functions the, the organs um, uh, accomplish but um, they kind of serve as like sensory organs and she's uh, she's very Lilith is very repulsed she can't look at the aliens she's really shocked she uh, she has this kind of a bodily response to the to the uh, shock of meeting an alien and it's uh, generally kind of slowly being desensitized by meeting more and more uh, aliens and 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 understanding more and more about them uh, she also understands that, um, or she's been told, that um, there is other humans that also kept on the ship, the others that were saved, um, and obviously um, other aliens. And she learns that the um, aliens have a three-gender system. Uh, so they have a male-female gender and a gender called Oloi. Um, and the Oloi are, um, I guess, quite, quite strange uh gender so they uh they're kind of like spiritual slash um uh i don't know how to explain them like um uh, they are biological mediators uh, it's no no mating happens without the or without the alloy kind of so male and female can't mate uh without an alloy an alloy has to be present um, and the uh, the alloy has like kind of a specific function, um, which is also related to uh, Earth and um, and what the aliens <coughs> want from Lilith. So the the alien that meets her uh, explains that um, they want her to uh, help them resettle Earth, uh, and she will be um, uh, like trained and um, and provided support and help and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and she's responsible for, for kind of helping other humans to accept the aliens and to become accustomed to the appearance and to their appearances and their differences. Um, and the Owen Kali and the humans uh, want to, um, the, or the Owen Kali want to live on Earth together with humans and help them repopulate the Earth. Um, and the, the the way they see that happening is uh, through uh, this kind of like trading of genetic material. So they offer Lilith to, well, not, they don't just offer, they actually end up enhancing her um, her body in a way that she becomes almost like kind of superhuman. Um, but um, but the, the, the condition for, for them helping her repopulate Earth is that they would be trading genetic material so they would um, there would be an alloy present in uh, human mating, in so that or, and humans will be mating with the Oankali in general, so that they can, um, uh, I, I guess, like mm, take some of the human genetic material. Uh, they um, the, the um, idea is that the Oankali evolve through. Um, uh, taking traveling through space and taking genetic material from various species, um, and it's um, he he uh, uh, explains that this is necessary for their own survival, basically. Um, and um, I, I, I'll be surprised if you reading it were not, but uh, Lilith is terrified by that prospect, 
uh, and uh, repulsed and shocked and obviously that the things is it's not going to happen um, and throughout like for the, for the rest of the book she kind of generally is desensitized to that idea uh, she meets um, uh, an Oloi called uh, Nikanj and uh, they end up um, kind of becoming really good friends I guess <laughs> or having some kind of relationship and uh, teaching each other different things uh, and then um, Nikanj is the one that enhances Lilith's kind of, um, strength and body in various ways um, and uh, they end up having um, I suppose um, some kind of relationship, romantic relationship, I guess. Uh, although she, like, it's it's interesting because in the book she has, um, she feels very conflicted about it, but she also feels very attracted to it. Uh, so this is kind of like an interesting tension. Um, and um, uh, so and as the, the book progresses, they awaken, they awaken other humans that are on the ship, and they go through kind of various training. Uh, uh, simulators, uh, Lilith meets a man, uh, Joseph, that she really likes, um, and they become romantically involved. Mm. And when um, there's a weird moment when they have uh, Joseph and Lilith have sex, and uh, the Oloi is there, and it's, uh, it's good, it's, it's quite interesting. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and uh, anyway, so the other humans that are, are also waking up. Uh, unsurprisingly also feel very conflicted about the whole uh alien situation some of them think that lilith is a traitor um she think they think that she's uh um uh you know that they're very suspicious of her they think she's somehow connected to the oan kali and in some in some ways like not thinking the best for humanity um i guess there's a lot of um ethical tension um and through a conflict uh, they uh, they end up um, killing Joseph and um, uh, and um, also in that conflict they injure Nikanj um, and um, it, also I think Lilith but um, so they, they see that she heals um and they yeah she was like they're very suspicious of her very suspicious of the fact that she is helping Nikanj to 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 get better uh etc etc um and um is decided at the end of the book is decided by the um on kali that um she will stay on the ship uh, Lilith will stay on the ship for a bit longer and um she'll be training the next like group of humans that's going to be awakened and that's the f first book. Um, I'm not going to mention much about the second and the third book, apart from um, just kind of give, to give you um, a little bit of an idea of what they are. So the second book is um, um, taking place on Earth, where humans and Owen Kali are living together, and um, there has been a few um, births of children from Owen Kali and human parents. Uh, and the story follows the uh, first, uh, they're called constructs, and the story follows the first construct like this, uh, whose name is Akin, and he's the son of Lilith. Um, and then in uh, the third book, he is called Imago, we follow another one of Lilith's children, a much later construct. Um, and um, um, in the second book, there's a lot of conflict between kind of, uh, humans that are resistors and humans that are uh, living with the aliens and Akin is um, I guess trying to make sense of his heritage is like uh, half human half on Kali and like he looks really human and it's very um, quite difficult he sympathizes a lot with the resistors and etc etc uh, and in the third book um, the child that we're following is uh, kind of very um, very much or Kali child um, and uh, again uh, it's, it's it's quite interesting his name is Judah their name actually is Judah um, and it's um, um, a lot of the kind of the general opinion is that the third book uh, brings some like kind of completes the the cycle by bringing together the humans and the Ong Kali um, okay so that was my 
very brief <laughs> uh, description of the book. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's an interesting picture actually. That's the first cover of the book when it was published. Um, it looks, it, it doesn't look like I imagined it on Kali, but yeah. Anyway, um, that's, that's that. Uh, and we're going to move on to talk about a few different um, uh, themes today uh, that we've kind of, um, as, as previously I've picked up from the book and I hope you find interesting. Um, and the first theme actually I want to um, introduce is um, um, kind of the question of the body that runs through the, uh, through the, through the book and actually through a lot of Octavia Butler's books. Um, and how uh, that functions and is constructed. And I wanted to start by introducing you to a sci-fi concept that I, not sci-fi, sorry, it's a literary concept that refers to sci-fi sci books and utopias. Um, and I've wanted to introduce you to that one for from the very first class but I keep forgetting. Uh, so I think this is a perfect, perfect time to introduce you to this. Um, and it's the com uh, concept of estrangement. Um, and estrangement is a um, refers to a literally literary technique um, used most commonly in sci-fi or utopian um, literature, where the the something that's mundane um, and kind of everyday and and I suppose normal um, is made new and strange. And in the way the way that's done is uh, usually through um, um, using, let's say, the, the uh, a concept in the book. So maybe the concept is, um, uh, I don't know, uh, marriage. Um, the way it's done is that um, the the in the beginning of the book that concept would be used without being explained. Uh, so the reader would assume that is the same concept that or it has the same meaning that they used to. Uh, and at some point there would be kind of a uh, a crisis or maybe like um, uh, something that reveals that it actually has a different meaning so that this uh, this concept is made um, our our understanding of it has been shaken uh, and and has been um, I don't know, displaced maybe is the good word um, so that we have more uh, space in that and more scope to understand it when it's introduced in a new way um, and um, um, so that could be something like, um, yeah, I guess like uh, gender is, is a quite common one, but it could be something like marriage or um, sexuality or identity or race. Um, um, it's like, um, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I think it's a quite powerful tool because it undoes a lot of these um, processes of normalization that we normally that we have uh, around uh, around various social concepts in particular and the one that I think um, the, the reason why I wanted to introduce it here is because um, um, Octavia Butler often um, uh, often does that to our understanding of of bodies and identities and, and kind of in how we um, understand the complexities uh, surrounding the body um, and uh, and she takes this kind of com mundane understanding of the body and these mundane things around uh, race and sexuality and, uh, and, the, and the process of having sex um, and makes them strange makes the process of understanding the body uh, really um, new and and complicated um, and um, um, I think one of the, the central questions um, that she explores in, in most of her fiction, but also particularly in this, is how do we how do we understand the concept of difference um, in relation to bodies, and how do we understand difference? Um, how are our bodies constituted through difference? Um, and this is um, this is a question that is not going to sound new. We discussed it already last week a little bit, uh, but we're going to discuss it a little slightly differently uh, this this week. Um, and usually, um, you know, the way we understand body or bodies, human bodies, is by assigning various um, reference or, or various kind of, um, um, I want to say, arbitrary categories to them. So, um, in a sense, uh, what that means is that you know we we're dividing humanity on uh, on, on the axis of you know, people who have uh, certain um, 
sexual characteristics versus or like uh yeah and then the other categories of people who have different sexual characteristics so one side is people maybe who have breasts and the other side is people who don't have breasts or like vaginas and penises but uh, i suppose the, the reason why i'm saying arbitrary is that we can always say um um you know why don't we divide humanity in people with blue eyes and people with brown eyes for instance or like you know something else um and uh and i suppose she's um, she's kind of thinking along these lines. She's thinking, okay, we have all these arbitrary categories in which we um, understand or separate humanity and understand the question of identity. Uh, what happens if we um, kind of make that new, uh, try to reimagine it in a, in a new way? Um, and I guess, yeah, I suppose that's also not too different from other uh, utopias that we have read or will read but it, it's something that's very prominent in her work um, and the body particularly for her is something that's um, indispensable in understanding how um, identity is formed and uh, and utilized um, and that's uh, that's an interesting uh, and complex negotiation because um, it, it it implies a certain embodiment so you, so your body is not uh, kind of attached from um from your identity uh, sorry your body is not dear your body is connected to your identity um and i suppose the 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 way it connects to last week and also generally to feminism is uh this question of nature and uh and you know we know um from from last week and from previous um i'm sure from from your previous studies that uh feminists have uh really battled with this um with the with the problem not the problem the question of nature um where we have on one side ideas of biological essentialism and uh and determinism and the body kind of um being instrumental in um um in in uh, creating identity uh to to like a really kind of strong extreme the essentialist extreme and on the other hand we have the so-called like post-structural so uh, or postmodern theorists who claim that uh, the body is just like something like a text that can be read and that's like, maybe people like judith butler um so there isn't anything that we can kind of clearly um uh attribute to uh to the body that creates an identity um and i suppose um the where where octavia butler stands is and also i guess um where the feminists that we're going to be studying today stand uh, is that um they're, they're trying to what well, they don't want to deny this um um the the, the the power of nature they don't want to deny that there are biological differences between sexes but also between people um, um, but they want to kind of disentangle that from questions of identity and how identity is constructed, um, and um, um, and we have um, we have people like um, Octavia Butler who kind of do that in fiction, but we also have people like Donna Haraway who we're going to be uh, talking about today who do that in in kind of feminist uh, philosophy. Um, and I am I'm very excited to be talking about Donna Haraway, um, n not least because she uh, her writings are just so exciting and fun. Um, but in um, but it, this is a particularly interesting relationship between Butler uh, Octavia Butler and Donna Haraway because Donna Haraway actually explicitly says that she thinks that Octavia Butler is the uh, is a sci-fi author of uh, of cyborgs. I can't remember the exact quote, but I think that's how it goes. Um, and uh, and Butler and um, Haraway both try to uh, entrench the human body and and the question of technology, um, and which I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, in in nature. So neither of them is kind of separating uh, the body and understanding it just as a system of signifiers or just as a text that can be read, um, um, and or, and and they're refusing this. Um, uh the 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 duality between uh, nature and technology and somehow kind of nature existing outside technology or nature um or technology saving us from nature um in in both of their works technology body nature are all mixed together um and um 
and that's particularly interesting um at, like also at the time um in relation to ideas of scientific progress and technological progress and that plays out really really interestingly in this book so um bear with me and we'll get there um and uh, and i just want to kind of clarify because uh, i feel like um when the cyborg manifesto was written in which in 75 i think was on the timeline um the um, I, I think there were um okay no let me let me say something else i think today we have uh two kind of um ways of understanding cyborgs and techno utopias and that um i had a, a friend say that last week actually say so uh, thank you friend for saying that I think it was a really interesting distinction uh, one of them is kind of the core lefty radical style of Donna Haraway um, and uh, a bunch of other feminists Rosie Bradotti we're going to talk about her today as well um, who are kind of promoting for this kind of hybrid uh, um, po politics of affirmation and difference um, and um, positivity uh, and on the other hand I think we have slightly different type of cyborgs and techno utopias uh which is kind of the elon musk um type of silicon valley dudes uh who think that hyper capitalism and uh i don't know establishing a, a, a hyper capitalist colony on mars is going to save humanity um and to, so we we're not going to talk about that bit we're going to talk about that bit because i think it's the core bit and there's the one i think that has the um kind of revolutionary and, and liberate liberatory potential okay so what i wanted to talk about and i can see that we're not doing that well on time i am not doing that well on time um is um yeah so it's um is this idea of cyborg and the cyborg um as present in octavia butler's work um, and I, um, 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 well, I, I put Cyborg Manifesto up, I think, yesterday or the other day, so don't worry if you haven't read it. Um, it's, um, uh, it's a book, or it's an essay by Donna Haraway, uh, written in 75, I think. Um, and it's, um, uh, uh, the, her, it's kind of been misread, I think. Um, a little bit um, in terms of that uh, in terms of the cyborg is often understood as some kind of human uh, techno hybrid uh, which is not um, not incorrect but it's not the complete picture um, and her her main argument and she, she's kind of intervening at a time when there was um, a lot of um, technophobic leftism um, and particularly uh, kind of I guess um, fears around uh nuclear apocalypse and um and capitalist technologies that are um kind of developing um hyper um um i'm gonna say hyper evil but like developing particularly weapons uh that um you know might lead to the end of the world uh, on one side and on the other side i guess a bit of the kind of eco-feminist uh peace activist earth defender camp uh, and, uh, and she writes at that time and what she wants to say, it, it, what she wants to do is basically um, tear down these uh, these divisions uh, and uh, it, she describes herself as a Sp Sp Sputnik Catholic, no idea what this means, um, but she, she wants to kind of destroy all these dichotomies between uh, mind and body and human and animal and organism and machine nature culture so all these kind of traditional western uh, philosophies um, men and women uh, primitive civilized uh, everything she says um, is um, is is kind of all human and technological and nature at the same time uh, one of her kind of famous claims is that we've never been human um, and she clarifies that as that um, like we um, it, it's we've like we've had this framework of thinking about organic and um, organic material and cells as somehow opposed to and fighting uh, machines but actually um, th there's never been a kind of a clear boundary um, and that really funnily reminds me of, um, of a meme that I saw recently which was that um, uh, it was uh, I think somebody complaining about um, 
wearing masks because of COVID. Uh, and the complaint was, um, if the uh, if God wanted us to wear masks, he would have just made us be born with masks. Uh, and there was an answer underneath by somebody else saying, uh, <laughs> what was it? Um, uh, have you ever heard of shoes? Because I have some really bad news for you. <laughs> Um, so it's quite, I, I suppose it's kind of like this idea that uh, we've never really like technology is not just kind of microchips and 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 metally bits uh, that do things for us. We've always had technology somehow involved in 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 human evolution and human development and human history. Um, and technology has always been part of nature. So we've always made technology with elements from nature or like with um, materials from nature. Um, um and uh, etc um and um and it's, i suppose she also wanted to one of the other kind of big boundaries that she wants to destroy that um i wanted to mention is the um is, is this division of humans as actors and humans as agents and the rest of the world as um just kind of um passively watching or experiencing humanity um, and she wants to say that um, actually um, the the like, cyber politics is recognizing that um, everything in the world um, has agency and is involved in politics. And I thought that was super pertinent to talk about in relation to COVID and how you know one tiny bacteria has entirely changed the world in in the last year and and it's changed human politics massively um so i think you know that that resonates a lot with um with her idea of the cyborg and uh, the cyborg um the cyborg manifesto and her other books are written in this like incredible language um i i find it i personally find it amazing to read i find it really inspiring and really fun but it's it's really hard to think of it as i suppose as philosophy um um it kind of um i guess it looks more like fiction or reminds reminds people more like a uh, more fiction um and that's um and, and that's something that she explicitly talks about and says uh, uh how uh, i think she calls it uh, like um um uh what was the quote uh, something like grammar is politics by other means uh, so she's uh, she's kind of rejecting this uh, patriarchal uh, masculine way of of talking and of doing grammar and doing politics and she says um, that cyber politics is always a struggle for language and a struggle against uh, perfect communication it's always kind of this blended communication uh, I suppose cyborg language is the language that um, well some of us maybe remember the language of texting when you only had um, uh, certain uh symbols that you could use so like you're using the the, the number four instead of the, the word four and etc etc so this is this is the cyber language that she talks about this kind of code that translates into um into like uh, understanding um and uh and she's um um you know, she, she's talking about the revolutionary potential of the cyborg so the cyborg is something that um uh tears down boundaries uh rejects kind of these identity categories uh especially um identity categories based on uh, uh on on kind of these socially constructed um categories but also takes into account difference uh, especially like biological material difference um in a way that is not um rejecting or like is not incorporating technology uh, as or the binary divisions of nature and technology um and in a sense um yeah she claims that we've we we are all already cyborgs the the manifesto ends with this um amazing uh sentence i absolutely love it i might even get it tattooed one day it's so good um which is uh i would rather be a cyborg than a goddess um, and um and i think that's really interesting in the way that it relates to um Lilith's brood, um, not just because you know um, Harry herself sees um, Lilith's brood as uh, a pure expression of of these like politics of cyborg, but also um, looking at how Octavia Butler constructs this uh, um, relationship between technology and nature. Uh, so we have um, 
so she's kind of not denying that there is biological differences in particular between obviously the aliens and the humans uh, but um, she, she wants to I think um, uh, reject this uh, um, this division or like sorry um, she's she's not denying that there are biological differences uh, but is uh, rejecting the idea or the um, the structure where these differences are used to um, 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 it create gender or racial power structures um, and that's um, uh, and, and that's I guess yeah kind of opposite to some postmodern um, feminists who want to deconstruct these categories and view bo the bo bodies as texts um, and Butler Octavia Butler that's so confusing because there's Judith Butler uh, Octavia Butler um, looks um, ha the way that she constructs the aliens I think is uh, is interesting because uh, their kind of biology their bodies is also the technology um, in the in, in the in the whole universe so they they are kind of gene splices or like they they can do things with genes uh, but they don't need any technology to do that they can just do this through their own bodies so the the, the, the way you know the sex happens is that all it connects with both people that are having sex and then if um, if there is to be conception the alloy puts the best bits of the genes together I suppose is the is the whole idea also mixed with some of their own genes um, isn't it weird how this like just makes I don't know it makes me a bit cringy I don't know why just the whole idea is a bit cringy uh, I'd be curious to, to, to hear how you experienced it but yeah so, so like the body itself is technology and I suppose the other way it maps up onto the cyborg manifesto is how this um uh like for her technological progress for octavia butler technological product progress is actually also knowing your body so the more you learn about your body the more you're able to kind of communicate with your body uh the more that that's that is the uh technological um uh, progress there and uh, I wanted to bring in here another theorist very briefly, um, Rosie Bradotti, who is also drawing heavily on uh, this, um, um, on Har who is drawing on Haraway and also heavily on Deleuze and this idea of difference that we talked about last time. Um, and, um, and I suppose her, um, the, the, her kind of um, political slash philosophical project um, is the... Um, is the is posthumanism and it's the idea of kind of pushing for a uh, this recognition and proliferation of differences uh, which at the same time is taken as um, the basis for constructing solidarity so it's rejecting essentialized identity politics in favor of understanding and incorporating difference in a way that um, creates solidarity um, and um, and the the, the or like her idea of um, cyborg and posthuman, or her idea of the posthuman is strongly related to uh, Haraway's idea of the cyborg, where she always she also talks about how humans are always cyborgs. You know, the um, having wearing glasses is a cyborg, painting your hair it means you're a cyborg, um, having taking birth control means that you're a cyborg. Um, all of these ways in which we modify um, our bodies and and rethink um, uh, the embodied self uh, are ways of kind of becoming cyborg or like incorporating technology in um, in our lives. Um, and um, the the second theme that I wanted to talk about uh, is the ah. Uh, um, is, is kind of relates to this idea of difference uh, and um, and how both um, difference and um, uh, or how both um, cyborgs and posthumans um, relate back to this question of nature and the the, the theme of nature um, and um, uh, I wanted to talk about it in relation to the book because um, the other kind of um, really obvious theme that comes up and is uh, often discussed when um, the book is discussed is the the topic of slavery and uh, and uh, colonialism uh, and obviously the, um, uh, the kind of the first thing that is uh, visible is how um, 
like the, the entire book is almost like a metaphor for slavery and, and for what happened to um, um, to Africa. Uh, in particular, I think it's interesting to think about um, Christian um, Christian missionaries going to um, to the African continent and trying to, um, I suppose, like uh, civilize um, the, the people there and. Uh, and how they went with this idea that you know that they are benevolent, that they're nice, uh, that they're helping, um, and I guess that seems very kind of um, pertinent um, to the way that um, Oloi or like the Oankali are presented in the book, uh, but also kind of the same um, s similar conflict of like um, when. Um, slaves were taken away and uh you know there was um like there was this kind of um urgency of survival and urgency of like having to conform and having to accept so this like the power balance i think is or the power imbalance i think is very similar um and um and this kind of urgency of like surviving convincing other people to survive the, the questions of resistance also uh, i think there's like a lot of parallels there um, but I think one of the, the kind of interesting parallels that um, we can make um, in relation to to the question of technology and cyborgs is uh, how both in the book and in in uh, in in human history in real life um, the there was a physical genetic restructuring of the native population that was taken away. Um, and made slaves and um, you know one way in, in which this was done was through um, um, sexual practices in non-consensual sexual practices um, but also through um, I suppose the, um, the the experience of generational trauma that is still present in African Americans um, and also, I, you know, like you can you can compare that quite heavily to, uh, sorry, quite closely to um, post-colonial thinkers from South uh, South and Central America. Um, I think an interesting contribution is um, um, Gloria and Zaldua, um, where like um, she talks about uh, the question of um, hybridity and how. Um, no, well, she, she's quite. Her book is called, I think, Borderlands. She's quite fo focused on the idea of borders, um, and particularly, you know, kind of the Mexican-U.S. Um, border, but also borders between human and animal and human and machine, um, and um, and the same way that um, Anzaldúa talks about um, the, uh, I think, is the the concept of mestizo or mestizo. Sorry, I can't really pronounce it in Spanish. Um, is as this kind of like multiracial identity that is like very hybrid. It's very ambiguous. Um, like she says, uh, I really like this bit. She says something like, uh, uh, "Rigidity means death." Or like, you know, if we if we if this fluidity stops, like it's it's the end of the identity. So it's all about this process and these relations, um, which is also something that Stuart Holt, talk, um, the um, great British theorist Stuart Hall, also post-colonial thinker, um, talks about this kind of idea of hybridity, of hybrid identity, of like uh, this kind of constant like shape-shifting and mixing. Um, and um, I don't think I need to even like tell you how, the, how that's in the book, but uh, you can see um, all, you know, all these like kind of identities that are put into um, 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 like that, that are made to be kind of unstable and uh, and they have to evolve and they have to to in some way become mixed and hybrid identities to continue um we can we know that the humans that choose to um mate without um um alloy without um aliens they can't have children so there's like a lot of stasis in there whilst there's a lot of like movement and um um and 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 it's interesting, I think, because, you know, it does, it, and, and I don't know about you, but, you know, it makes me feel really uncomfortable, this idea of, like, mixing with the aliens. But at the same time, uh, when they read post-colonial theory um, and when they, you know, when they look at uh, ideas of hybridity, 
uh, I get really excited and I think that's great. <laughs> and then, you know, I think, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah, I'm, I'm really into this. Uh, but, but like, so, so I think it's kind of interesting to talk about this. I think it's to do with the power imbalance and like whether or not you choose that hybridity um, yourself. Um, and a few other things that I wanted to pick on in relation to um, uh, to to difference is, and the book is the question of resistance um, and how um, in this um, the, the the political resistance in the books is pretty much um, entirely um, um, oriented around the question of survival um, and um, and um, yeah human survival. Um, so there, there isn't any really like other politics per se I, I think I don't know correct me if I'm wrong in the seminar uh, but there is um, mm, th there is this question of survival um, and that's also quite interesting from kind of post-human transhuman perspective um, and I'm going to draw very quickly again on Rosie Bradotti with uh, the, the the kind of her discussion of the division between Zoe and Bios um, Zoe being, um, I guess, the kind of life that um, is um, um, like bear life is what Agamben calls it. Is is like the life that animals maybe lead. Um, it's it's just like is uh, is is just life stripped out of any comfort. It's like just basic survival. And on the other hand, we have bios, which is. Um, a little bit like the good life but like also life that's a little bit more comfortable uh it's it's kind of like human life it's life with purpose life with consciousness um and um and and i guess like um quite often in western philosophy it was thought that zoe was the life of um of animals and bios was the life of humans um but um People like Agamben and Bradotti and others are, are questioning this in particular, kind of talking about um, uh, people who experience various kinds of oppression um, being confined to uh, a life of Zoe or like being pushed into a life of Zoe. Um, and I guess we can maybe think about um, the role of austerity politics in the UK in relation to Bios and Zoe. Um, but in the book, that's uh, you know, it's it's quite like a clear division. So on one hand, we have the humans who've chosen to live without the uh, the aliens, and like they can never have any, like this good life. They're like always limited um, to kind of this survival, pure survival. Whilst the humans who choose to live with the aliens, who choose to embrace that um, future. Uh, have more of a, I guess, bios of like better life. You know, they they're given like superpowers that make like hybrids, and they the children are constructs, etc., etc. Um, and this is all quite quite closely connected to questions of power um, and how power operates. Um, and um, I'm noticing we don't really have that much time. I don't have that much time left. Uh, but one one thing that I wanted to um, mentioned briefly in relation to power um, is uh, this uh, kind of um, uh, this way of understanding power which is uh, through the concept of affect um, and affect um, being the capacity to affect and be affected um, and I think I think it's really interesting in the book because um, and in in the way it, it relates to bios and Zoe because um, Okay, let me just explain it for a second. So, so if um, affect is this capacity to affect and be affected, I think Manuel Delanda has a really uh, neat little explanation of like uh, something like uh, an object, maybe like um, a glass, um, has the uh, has like three ways that it can affect the world. You know, you can you can lift it, you can drink from it, you can put it down, you can fill it up. I don't know, there's maybe four. Um, and it has like a you know limited range in which it, it can engage with the rest of the world. Um, and the bicycle has maybe like I think he says fourteen ways because you can move in like fourteen directions, you can do fourteen things, whatever. Uh, and and it's kind of like the same for humans, but you know it's not um, it, it, like not every human has the same capacity to affect and be affected as every other human. So that's kind of like where power comes in. So you can you can build that capacity. Um, or you can be, or that capacity can be taken away from you in various ways. 
um, and I think it's that's kind of really interesting in the book because we can we can see how uh, like for the for the humans that are uh, refusing for the resistors uh, their capacity to um, affect and be affected uh, is limited because they can't like they literally cannot physically survive they uh, past um, past their own death like the the genes are gonna die they're not gonna have humans and that's kind of like a, a straightaway limit um, and and you know in none of the um, books they kind of explicitly threaten that the aliens never explicitly threaten they're never explicitly aggressive they're never explicitly um, mean to the humans but at the same time they massively reduce the human capacity to uh, or the human affect the capacity to affect and be affected in the world um so yeah so that's something we can maybe think about um and the last bit i wanted to to talk about um like i mean it's, it's just to, to mention um is that um you know even though the book is seen as almost like a metaphor for slavery it's also seen as uh, like a utopian Afro Afrofuturistic novel, uh, and I'm not going to really talk much about Afrofuturism because it's it's quite like a loose concept. Um, it mostly refers to kind of um, visual art or like sci-fi. Uh, Octavia Butler is a particularly like um, um, you know she's taken as like one of the big examples for Afrofuturism, uh, but. Um, but it's mostly yes, but kind of like an aesthetic style, a bit of like philosophy, um, and it's uh, reimagining. It refers to reimagining the future uh, with um, this idea of, um, I guess, like uh, putting blackness as central, um, and um, and reimagining, um, like I guess, some kind of technologically advanced future where blackness is central. Uh, so it's really cool. Um, but it's you know it's not it's not like a coherent philosophy. It's more like kind of like a, a general um, I suppose discourse or something in the in the ether. And it was coined by uh, somebody called Mark Derry in an essay called "Black to the Future." Super good title. Um, and is um, you can see on the I hope you can see on the little shiny PowerPoint. Uh, people like Janelle Monet and Beyonce have kind of incorporated that style visually. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to mention it because it seems like it's the counter, um, uh, the, the kind of other narrative that goes th through the book. So on one hand, we have the slave slavery narrative or like the post-colonial narrative. And on the other hand, we have the Afrofuturism narrative. So kind of like a maybe more positive, uh, positive narrative. 